This summer, I've gotten to be kind of like Batman, the superhero, except instead of by day, I am not a millionaire. Instead, by day, I'm a computer technician. And at night, instead of being a crime fighter, I work on sermons to preach on the weekends. <laughs> it's been a wonderful experience this summer, but it's about to come to an end. In the next week, I'm about to embark on the last nine months of college until I finish my undergraduate degree. As scary and fun as that sounds, the future awaits, and that is going to be so much fun. <laughs> if you'll bow your heads and pray with me, we'll get started today. Dear Heavenly Father, we are gathered here today to worship you and to give praise to your name. All the glory and all the honor be to you, Lord. It is in your holy and mighty name that we pray. Amen. Now, some of you might get a little frustrated, but I'm about to explain the basic plot line of the movie Home Alone, so I'm sorry if it spoils anything for you, but I need this to set up like an image for you guys so that you can understand best where I was at the time for the story that's about to come. So the basic plot line of Home Alone is this. There's this young boy. He's kind of the outlier child of the family. And when the family gets ready to embark on this vacation, chaos ensues in the morning of the time for travel. And the family packs up, miscounts all of the children and all the family members in advance, and leaves the youngest, Kevin, at Home Alone. And so the movie, Home Alone, is from Kevin's point of view as he spends his time alone at home as a six-year-old and does all of the crazy things that you think a six-year-old can do and then even more so that is above his age. So if you have that mindset now, this six-year-old just getting to do whatever he wants to do as he's home alone with no supervision, it's at that moment that I am feeling when I'm at the mall. In junior high, all of my friends like to go to the mall and hang out and do fun things. Looking back upon it, we didn't really do anything but walk around and cause trouble. <laughs> But it's at that time that we, I had texted all my friends on Friday and like, guys, let's go to the mall Saturday morning. Everyone was like, yeah, sure, let's go. So Saturday morning, I show up to the mall, excited to hang out with my friends, and I don't really know why. But at the time, it was exciting. My parents dropped me off. I quickly run away from them. I head into the mall. And there, I start waiting and waiting, and I start texting my friends. And I was like, hey, guys, when are you coming? And slowly but surely, each and every one of them starts replying that they're not going to show up. So, kind of like Kevin, I grab some food, grab some pretzels, and I start walking around. I find myself in a sporting goods store, and I see a lot of these cool like workout equipment things on display. And so I just help myself on to them and start playing with them. Apparently, when they put stuff on display, it's for display and not for trying. <laughs> Long story short, they kicked me out. I tell you this story because at that time, junior high me was super excited to hang out with his friends and to do all of these fun things and just walk around the mall aimlessly. But what ended up happening is my friends had let me down. They didn't show up. They broke, I had hoped that they would show up and then they broke that. I had trusted that on Friday when they said they would be there, that they would be there, and then they weren't. I had hoped and trusted that they would be there. But it's my hope today that when we leave here, that today's scripture will provide you with these three W's. That these three W's of hope will help, put, help us put our hope in a position that is not among our flaky junior high friends or others who are going to eventually let us down, but rather put our hope and our trust into something, someone that is greater and that will never fail us. Now some of you are going to be like me and the moment you hear the word poetry, or the moment you start to see these stanzas, these little awkward paragraphs on a page, you start to gloss over it and to go through it really quickly. Because the first word of rhyming and the first awkward space paragraph and the illusions that everyone seems to get except for myself, they just go right over your head. But I hope that today, even though we're gonna be adventuring into a book of poetry, I hope that today we can be a little bit different. At least I know I need to look at it a little bit differently and see it for what it is, a beautiful and artful prayerful language that has direct application to our lives. The particular psalm that we're gonna be looking at today opens with such a beautiful and eloquent exaltation of praise. The psalmist opens up with, 
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul, I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. And that opens up today's passage. Now, at that time, it was the duty of the kings to advocate for the helpless. It was their job to make sure that their people were taken care of. And as we can remember from our Sunday school lessons as a kid, or the Bible encounters that we've come across throughout life, that in the Old Testament, the kings were not very good. And they oftentimes, like the junior hires, failed me at the mall. Not so bitter. But like that time, they had always been letting down their, their people. And so it's with that mindset that we're going to be picking up today where these kings are just constantly failing. And so the psalmist writes in response to that. So verses 3 and 4 are going to be pick, where we're going to be picking up today to look at the three W's of hope. So if you will turn with me to Psalms 146, we'll be picking up verse 3. Put not your hope in princes. In a son of man in whom there is no salvation, when his breath departs, he returns to the earth, and on that very day his plans perish. Blessed is he whose hope is the God of Jacob, whose hope is the Lord his God. Put not your trust in princes, but in the son of man. I know when I read that, the poetry, the poet enthusiast in me was like, oh great. Put your trust in princes and in the hope of man. Like, what is this supposed to mean? As I broke it down, it basically is trying to say, don't trust people because sooner or later they're going to let you down. Great. Could have said that, but instead they had to put it in poetry form. Why? I don't know. But by leaving them all, like I mentioned earlier, the symbolism goes right over my head. So when I'm reading about this, the princesses and princesses and do not trust them, I have to break it down into very, very simple points that I don't understand. And so, if we can substitute that word prince, prince for president, it starts to make a little bit more sense, at least in our American mind, at least in my American mind. So let's look at this verse by replacing the prince with president. And so how many times when presidents are campaigning, do they promise us the world and then never deliver? Or, like in this last election, they promise crazy things and then deliver it, and then you wonder that they never, we never thought that was possible, and then they did. I'm not going to get on a political soapbox here, but I bring that illusion to help bring this verse to light. That regardless of the people who are in power, they're going to let us down. Regardless of how nice they may seem, they're going to let us down. So when we attribute our hope and we put trust in them, ultimately it's just going to fail. Like putting trust in little junior hires to show up to the mall on a Saturday. It's going to fail. And so now we're left with this void. So if we can't trust the political leaders who are in power, we can't trust our friends, who, who are we going to trust and where can it go? So I ask, church, where does your hope come from? Where do you turn when things get rough? Now, being here on Sunday, surrounded by amazing believers, it feels almost natural to be like, yes, I put my trust in God. I put my trust in Him, and yes, yes. But I know, at least for me, if I'm honest, Finals Week comes around. And instead of going on my knees and praying for God and trusting Him that He has a plan and His will will be done, I put that pot of coffee on, and I open another stack of note cards, and I try to keep pushing through, only to find myself Wednesday on my knees in that same position of like, God, I can't do this on my own. The coffee's just not strong enough. So church, how often in our lives do we start to do that? Not necessarily for the big things, but even just for the little things like finals week or for when times at work get tough. The little things. How often do we try to put our hope in either other people or in coffee or in something tangible because it seems easier. All right, Cody, I'll bite. It doesn't matter where the hope goes, even in the little things. Okay, but if I can't put the hope in the political people or if I can't put my hope in coffee or note cards, where is it going to go? 
And so now that we've looked at where our hope is, and try to start to identify in our lives where we put that hope and our trusts, I want to look at who is worthy of our trust. So verses 5 and 7 is where the story continues. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. This God of Jacob, now, for some of you in here who love poetry and abstract language, you pick right up on that, and you're like, God of Jacob, and you start associating it with the character in the Old Testament, Jacob. Now, those of us who are like me and are a little more literal, just read that, and you're like, God of Jacob, cool. Jacob's God, Old Testament, great. And tend to miss out on a little bit more of that depth that poetry likes to go to. That... But the words of Charles, theologian Charles Spurgeon, I believe, eloquently bring that phrase to life. He writes about this. He says, the God of Jacob is the God of the covenant, the God of wrestling prayer. He is the God of the tribe believer. He is the living and the true God. And that's typical of poetry. The poet writes just on the surface, and he just writes very simply, the God of Jacob. But when you unpack that analogy and go so much deeper, you find this beautiful and elegant phrase, this is the God of Jacob, the God of the covenant, the God who is so much greater and so much more powerful than we could ever imagine. That is who we are talking about giving our hope and giving our trusts to. This is the God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. This is the God who created the rolling hills. The God who orchestrates the storms. He lets each life-giving droplet of water fall upon the crops that we are then able to enjoy and bring nourishment to our own bodies. So when we're looking for someone to trust, when we're looking for somewhere to put this hope and this trust that we need in order to continue focusing on our lives when times get rough, what better place than to give it to the Creator, the God Almighty, the God who has given us life. After all, we are made in his image and in his likeness. And he is so perfect and so good. So now we can see who should get our hope. Now you might be wondering why. We should put our hope and trust in this guy. So what makes this God guy so great and he's so much better and almightier than anything else? Well, I'm glad you had thought that. We finish up this psalm today with verses 7 through 10. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the saunders. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. But the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God of Zion to all generations. Praise the Lord. So why the God of Jacob, you ask? Because he is the Lord that set the prisoners free. Now, I'm not sure about you, but originally when I read that word prisoner, my mind immediately falls back to somebody who's a felon, who's incarcerated into a federal prison, a prisoner, somebody who's done something terribly wrong. And he does not once go to me as a prisoner. But the reality is that we are all prisoners. Now, not in the modern, normal sense of incarcerated behind bars, but rather that our souls are held captive to the sins that we've committed. For the Bible tells us that we have all sinned, and we are now separated from God because of that. And we are slave to those sins. But the hope is not lost there. Because if we keep placing our hopes among these worldly things, among money, among political leaders, among worldly people, it's going to keep getting crushed. But because we put our hope in God, the God of Jacob, he's a God who sets us free, and that these sins, they no longer matter. We are set free from them. We are no longer held captive. We are no longer prisoner. For Galatians 5.1 reads, For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. 
Not only does his God set us free, but he's a God who loves. He loves us enough to send his son down on earth so that he can die for our sins so we can be free, so that we can spend eternity with him. But not only that, he's God the creator, he's made the earth, and it is his domain to do with the earth as he will. And as the ending of the song, song reads, we should hear that and be joyous because this is his kingdom that he has created and that it can never come to an end because the Lord will reign forever. And neither does he die nor lose his throne because he is who he was and he will always be. Now, I cannot think of a better way to end this section than how the psalmist ends it. Well, praise the Lord. Just a simple phrase, but no matter how dark the times are, I believe it is vitally important that we remember that, that we remember that phrase, praise the Lord. Because when we're attributing our hope to Him, when we put our trust in Him, and we remember to praise Him, He will always be there for us. And even in our darkest times, if we're praising Him, a light is going to be lit, and we're going to enter the presence of God where everything is good and everything is perfect. And that is where we're celebrating. Because this is a God who will never fail us. He is perfect. He will never fail us. Now, church, today we looked at three W's of where it is important to place our hope. I'm sorry for those people who are type A, but the order was where, who, and why. And I chose that order specifically because it's out of the typical normal order. And it's my hope today that because that order is differently than because it seems a little bit odd that it will stick with each and every one of us as we leave. That it will be something that we can take away and go out into the world and do with. Where we find our hope. Because our hope, because when we look at where our hope is and what comes from trusting those who are not God and how it fails us. Because people are not perfect. So if we hold them up to that standard like they are, we're just going to get hurt. So where we put our hope is important. Who? Then we looked at somebody who is totally worthy of our praise, and that being the one true God, the creator of the world, the giver of life. And then we looked at why. Why God gets our hope and why he gets our praise. Because God is not human. He is perfect and no matter what. He will never leave us nor forsake us. Where, who, and why? So as we conclude today, I want to ask one more time. So these words may be fresh in our minds as we leave today. So we can go out into the world thinking about this. And when times get rough, we know exactly where to place our hope. So church, where does your hope come from? You better have to pray with me. Heavenly Father, as today's song records the saddening truth and the reality of life, that we cannot trust those around us, that we cannot put our trust in the world because ultimately it's going to fail. Lord, it is my prayer today that your words may resonate with each and every one of us as we leave today, that we will remember place our hope in you, that we will remember that when times get rough, that we must come to you. Lord, we thank you for this time that we are gathered today, and it's in your holy name that we pray. Amen.